Hello, welcome to Intermediate Accounting. Tonight we're going to be thinking about the environment and structure by which accounting standards are set. So first let's think for a minute about who has the authority for setting accounting standards and indeed how they get that authority. So the authority um, rests with Congress and Congress has decided really since the beginning of, of, of um, modern standard setting that they are hopelessly incapable of setting standards because they're so susceptible to political pressure. But watch carefully because Congress um, delegates the responsibility to set standards to the Securities and Exchange Commission. Now, please recognize that the Securities and Exchange Commission serves at the pleasure of the Congress. And this means that if the Congress can be bought, in quotes, then the Securities and Exchange Commission can be bought, in quotes. So typically, the Securities and Exchange Commission only gets into standard setting as a last resort or if um, they are facing um, undue political burden and we'll talk about that in a minute. So ordinarily, the Securities and Exchange Commission also delegates authority to accounting firms and businesses. And notice here the, um, what some people might say is the dilemma, that you have accounting firms and businesses setting rules for themselves. Finally, um, the accounting firms and businesses form FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board. And this turns out to be seven individuals who actually sit down and you might say an ivory tower, really in an office, and um, decide what kind of standards uh, need to be set on what topics. So no discussion of how standards are set would be complete without a discussion of the political environment in which they're set. So notice here that businesses and individuals um, have significant influence on Congress. And I've put businesses here without um, regard to individuals at the minute. Congress has significant influence on the SEC and SEC has, um, you know, delegates to firms and businesses to set standards. So the point here is I'm, I'm pointing out the um, relationship between those two. Businesses have influence over Congress and Congress is relying on business um, to, to help make up the FASB and set accounting standards. Therefore, um, there, there have been and will continue to be cases where good standards are not set because businesses don't want them set or bad standards are adopted because businesses uh, do want them adopted. So some examples of um, ugly fights that resulted in less than adequate standards being set. Um, Congress tried to, I'm sorry, uh, FASB tried to tackle derivatives in the 1990s. Uh, the derivatives were um, investments that derive value from another investment. The most simple example, some people say this is too, exam too simple, but it, it, it gives you an idea, is if you have an adjustable rate mortgage. So if you, if you buy one of those, if you invest in it, let's say a bank makes an adjustable rate mortgage and you buy the mortgage off the bank so that the, the borrower has to pay you. Well, we say that because the adjustable rate mortgage adjusts um, based on, a let's say, a Wall Street Journal rate, and then the, um, the loan rate is based off of the Wall Street Journal rate, we'll say that, that the loan rate is derived from the Wall Street Journal rate. So there were, there were concerns about how we should account for derivatives, um, how we sh whether we should worry about the, the fact that um, an underlying investment um, might be threatened by the, the um, economic environment. And really, a standard could never be passed. Uh, There's just too much political opposition. Um, also in the 1990s, we recognize that employees' stock options um, usually resulted in a cash outlay by the company. And it was nearly impossible to create a standard that actually showed the company's um, 
incurring an expense. So rather, we would show these as reductions of equity. And being that you're in intermediate accounting, expect you to have some understanding of, of these terms, but you know, the, the bottom line is um, we're reducing equity um, for cash payments made by businesses when really we should have been um, recording expenses. So these expenses for employee stock options are missing the income statement, even though um, if we just paid the employees just instead of giving them stock options, their payments would be expenses. Uh, Mergers in the in the earlier part of the 21st century um, were heavily influenced. The, the standard for mergers was heavily influenced by politics, and it was very difficult to set a fair value standard in the year 2007 because of uh, the political environment. Here's another example of the political environment. This one shows um, the pressures on the auditor. So. Keep in mind that what an auditor should be doing is looking at a financial statement. An auditor is supposed to be independent. They're looking at a financial statement and telling creditors and investors, hey, we're independent, we're not related to management, but um, we're looking at this financial statement, this balance sheet, this income statement, this statement of stockholders' equity, this statement of cash flows, and it looks correct. Well. Look a little bit closer at some of these extra lines I've drawn in. So first we have management on the top in black. And management pays the auditor. This is the way this operates in the United States. It has since um, the, the post-depression era reforms caused auditors to, um, to be required in many cases. Management's hired them. Management can fire them. Management also pays them. So you might say there's an inherent conflict of interest here in that management pays the auditor and also chooses them. So the auditor's next, and you might imagine at first that this red um, box where I've written management again doesn't, doesn't exist. So in an ideal world, management pays auditors to do, to do the work, um, gives them the assignment, and then walks away. And so um, the auditor looks at the financial statement, balance sheet, income statement, statement of uh, stockholders equity, statement of cash flows, tells the investor and the creditor, these are great, or these are terrible. But in reality, there's management again. So the auditor is getting ready to um, tell the investors or creditors the truth about the financial statements. And management is, um, again, let's say threatening in quotes with the money. Now, I don't mean to over or under imply what's going on here. It's rare that management would rise to the level of saying, you give me a clean opinion. You, you know, you say the balance sheet that's really crummy is great, or I'm firing you and getting another auditor. But rather, management will often ask over and over again to look at what the auditor's doing and might ask the auditor to consider making some changes. Also, there's always this implied threat that if management's hiring the auditor, then management in turn could fire the auditor. I've written Enron in here because this is exactly how this went down. Now, people have differences of opinion about what the Enron problem was. To make it simple, let me tell you that um, Enron was audited by one of the major accounting firms, Arthur Anderson, and Arthur Anderson had offices all across the United States in every big city. The city that Enron was based in was Houston, Texas, so Arthur Anderson had a um, Houston, Texas office. Now, for Arthur Anderson as a whole firm, the Enron account was a drop in the bucket. It didn't really um, matter whether Arthur Anderson lost Enron or not. Arthur Anderson, the firm, would survive. However, the Houston, Texas office, in a lot of ways, had a lot of autonomy, and that's very true of accounting firms. So, um, you might have a 200-person office in Houston where the managing partner uh, depends greatly on the Enron job. And indeed, if Enron leaves, this person gets fired. So I'd heard a statistic back then that Enron might have accounted for 20% of the Arthur Anderson billings in that office. That means if Arthur Anderson Houston didn't please Enron, then one-fifth of its billings would be gone. To me, 
This is a powerful incentive. I worked at a, 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 another firm, Ernst & Young, and I'm not afraid to say that because they're both international public type firms. I will, however, in the area of um, you know, confidentiality, not, not specifically describe the office, but I'll say that I was aware of an office where the, um, the office only existed in sort of a medium-sized town because there was a large um, client there that made up about 80% of the billings from the office. So we all joked and we all knew that if that client threatened to leave the, uh, the, the firm, for the partner that was uh, managing that office, refusing to do what the client said would cause almost certain um, dismantling of the office, a powerful incentive to obey management. So some people at the time said the problem was that Arthur Anderson was engaged in other things. They were doing taxes and management consulting and things like this, and that maybe their total billings um, were too high because they, they weren't independent. But you see, to me, it doesn't matter if they were just doing auditing or if they were doing these other things. The problem was the percentage of billings that Arthur Anderson represent, I'm sorry, that Enron represented to that office um, of, of Arthur Anderson in Houston. And I would argue that what happened in Houston in 2003, 2004 could happen anywhere. Um, one piece of confidence I get from firms is, um, you know, in hindsight, many Arthur Anderson employees and indeed other um, people in other firms uh, scratched their heads and said, you know, um, in the end, the federal government took Arthur Anderson down, pretty much closed the firm by saying that um, no, no firm that sold securities on the stock exchange could use Arthur Anderson as their auditor. And whether it was the employees of Anderson or whether it was the rest of us, we sat there and said, you know, all those people in all those other states and all those other cities, they, they, they never would have um, tolerated um, the coddling of Enron if they'd realized that, that their business might collapse. They just didn't need it that bad. So hopefully firms have, um, have set even stronger controls to keep something like that from happening. The Financial Accounting Standards Board set up a conceptual framework to try to um, not set standards haphazardly, to come up with a, with, with a methodology. So the objective of the conceptual framework is that information needs to be useful to investors and creditors. These are people who, um, who, who, who put money into the financial system. So here's the way the conceptual framework's laid out. We have the objective on the top. There are elements, assets, liabilities, equity, income, expense, all that stuff. Um, there are qualitative characteristics. Um, relevance, you know, is the, is the information relevant to users? Do they care about it? Is it reliable? Uh, might be important information, but um, can, can, do you have confidence in it? Is it comparable? Can you compare it to something else? Um, those elements also have to have um, common ways of, of, of recognizing them, of when to record them and when not to record them, how much to record them at, and whether any type of additional disclosure is necessary. Finally, the qualitative characteristics, the elements, and um, the, the recognition, measurement, and disclosures all serve to create um, adequate financial statements balance sheet, income statement, statement of stockholders' equity, and statement of cash flows. So hopefully, with the conceptual framework based around these four areas, um, we will achieve the objective, which again, is to provide information that's useful to both creditors and investors. One constraint on the framework is cost efficiency. So um, the argument here is no standard should be set um, that, that costs more than the information that it provides. Let me give you an example from real life. Um, there's, a, there's a rule that the federal government has that says that banks um, can't accept more than $10,000 in cash from somebody without doing a report. So today computer systems are very good, but I remember a time in the early 90s when I worked for a bank and the systems weren't that good. They did batch processing then, 
rather than real-time processing. So we were very interested in how we could tell if a person went into one branch, made a thousand dollars deposit, went into another branch, made a two thousand dollar deposit, and so on. So the federal government came in, they audited us, they asked us to consider um, buying a system that would aggregate all these transactions real time. Um, we considered it, as they asked, we went and we got prices, and we found that the price of that kind of system in the early 90s would have outweighed the benefit to the government. And so indeed, the government agreed with us and we decided not to implement that kind of system. That's what we mean by um, the, the standards need to be cost effective. They, they shouldn't be so costly for businesses and accountants to adopt that they outweigh any benefit to um, investors or creditors. Well, I hope you found this helpful. Good luck.